Like I think holiness in the abstract is not offensive. I think when it gets down to uh, submit your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, whatever you eat or drink, do all things to the glory of like when you get into those kinds of like specific exercises of holiness, that's when it get, gets offensive because now you're de dealing with people's idols. You know, mm -hmm. you're dealing with people's sin patterns and sin natures. Uh, it, it's an inconvenience to give your life as a living sacrifice when you don't want to. This episode is sponsored by the new film, Respect. Respect, starring Jennifer Hudson, follows the rise of Aretha Franklin's career from a child singing in her father's church to her international superstardom. Aretha handpicked Jennifer to betray her in this film, the remarkable true story of Franklin's journey to find her voice and never lose faith. Her music shaped a generation, topping music charts with anthems still relevant today, from think to respect to amazing grace. Jennifer Hudson's live performances of Aretha songs demand to be seen on the big screen. I saw it and it was a great film. Respect also stars Forrest Whitaker, Marlon Wayans, Audra McDonald, Mark Marone, Titus Burgess, and Mary J. Blige. Don't miss Respect, only in theaters, August 13th. Well, thank you for watching another episode of the Jew 3 Project podcast. As always, I'm Lisa Fields, the founder of the Jew 3 Project. And today I'm joined by a very special guest, Mrs. Jackie Hill Perry, soon to be Jackie Hill Perry, PhD. Uh, she has <laughs> a new book. In about 15 years. <laughs> <Yeah>. Correct. <laughs> You're right. Welcome. Welcome, Jackie. Thank you for having uh, the lesser intellectuals at the bottom of the pool. <laughs> <laughs> on your show i appreciate it glad to you're be not, here you're not you're not let's say you probably know more bible than some of the ones that have a phd honestly i'm trying um, girl <laughs> um tell our audience who don't know who you are just a little bit about yourself yeah so i uh, married seven years to a man named preston we have three daughters and one son on the way because i'm five months months pregnant and uh, yeah, I love Jesus and I do all things words. So writing books, communicating the scriptures and uh, yeah, just, yeah, <laughs> speaking about things all the time. And, and you make a bomb chili. Um, I just want to know that. <laughs> yeah, I that made Lisa some me. chili and she ate every ounce of it. it, it she, I, and I didn't even realize you wasn't responding to any of my like questions. You were just eating and saying, mm-hmm. It was amazing. I, I've been thinking about it since I left. Um, and a matter of fact, I asked my dad to make chili. Uh -huh. And I told him that you said there was two things you put in it that I'm not going to say because I don't know if you give those things away on the Internet. Right. And he saw me putting that in there and he was like, why? <laughs> I was like, I had, I, had, I had it before. Uh -huh. It's good. But mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it sounds crazy, but it it, it works. It yeah, really it does. It does. So, but we're not here to talk about that today. We're here to talk about your new book, Holier Than Thou. Mm -hmm. So, what made you? It. What made you tackle such a big topic like the holiness of God uh, with this new book? Um, one, I don't think I'm intimidated by those kinds of topics. You know, I, I, I talked about, I talk about sexuality. Uh, I wrote a Bible study on the book of Jude, which uh, nobody ever preaches on. Um, <laughs> so I think for me, it was why not? Uh, but it's also primarily because, um, I feel like how the culture is and even how our hearts are is symptomatic of what we believe about God. And I, I feel like there's never... Like you can never have enough resources about the nature of God, especially um, contemporary resources from, you know, a millennial that's also African American and woman. I think that just adds a different perspective to it. Mm -hmm. That's that's so good, so so helpful. Um, one of the things about holiness yeah. is when people, if you come up like Jackie and I in Pentecostal, uh, were you apostolic, Jackie? <laughs> Or Pentecostal? 
Uh, started Baptist and okay. then ended up Apostolic Pentecostal. Yeah. And so you know that. The, so I'm, I'm just all confused. <laughs> you know that holiness uh, can take on different forms in mm -hmm. the space of Pentecostal. What are some misnomers about holiness that you think people have, yeah. have been taught? Um, I feel like one of the primary ones is that holiness is just about rule keeping, you know, like when I used to go to church, like when I was growing up, it was like you had to wear dresses, you couldn't wear pants, you didn't go to the movies, you didn't listen to secular music, you didn't play cards, which is always confused. I'm like, why we can't play cards? Like I can't play Uno, <laughs> but I think they attributed that to too close to gambling or something. And so I think many people develop a framework of holiness that is completely centered around just be right, do the right thing. Uh, and it's like, yes, God's holiness, uh, what's included in it is his moral purity, his, his ethical standard, the fact that he is sinless, he is righteous, he is good, he is honest, he is faithful, he is consistent, all those things. Uh, but it's also his transcendence, the fact that he exists differently than us, that he is not creaturely in any way. And so I think when we hold both together, we see that holiness is actually much wider and broader than we have understood it or taught it or lived it. Mm -hmm. That's that's helpful. What what is holiness? What is the, yeah. the right understanding of it? Yeah. So the root word of holy is to cut or to separate. And so holiness conveys the idea of separateness. We obviously observe it first in Genesis 2 when God, uh, got some in my hair, when God <laughs> makes the uh, Sabbath day and he sanctifies it, he, he makes it holy, meaning he sets it apart as unique and distinct from all the other days. It's a day that's supposed to be treated holy as unto God. And so holiness, again, is just being set apart. Now the two categories that define God as holy, which I just mentioned, is God's moral purity, that God is righteous without blemish, without stain, without wrinkle. But it's also that God is transcendent. He is unique. He exists ontologically different <laughs> than us. Mm -hmm. And um, I think one of the, I think a really helpful, practical way to bring that down to, okay, what is, how does that help me <laughs> to understand that God is holy? Well, let's say the verse uh, cast your cares on me for I care for you. When you set up God's moral purity, it means he's not lying. Like it, it means he has compassion. He's not apathetic. But if he's transcendent, it means that because he's sovereign over your circumstances and sovereign over your cares, he can actually use them to work out for your good and his glory. And so I think both of those together just shows you like, oh, like God being holy is a really good thing. Mm -hmm. That's extremely helpful. Do you think holiness is controversial in this time? if we when we get practical about what it actually means to be it in our bodies yes <laughs> like i think holiness in the abstract is not offensive i think when it gets down to uh submit your body as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable unto god whatever you eat or drink do all things to the glory of it. like when you get into those kinds of like specific exercises of holiness that's when it get, gets offensive because now you're de dealing with people's idols you know mm -hmm. you're dealing with people's sin patterns and sin natures uh it, it's an inconvenience to give your life as a living sacrifice when you don't want to you know when you rather give it to every time dick and harry that comes your way and so that's part of the struggle yeah it cuts at our very core of of culture right now like our ability to dictate our own destiny, our own truth. Yep. Um, and so uh, I imagine that there will probably be people who uh, who don't like the concept uh, of holiness mm -hmm. in this day yeah. uh, because of that. Yeah, which is one thing I've been thinking about is how even if we don't like holiness, we, we want it. And what I mean mm. is... Um, like even the ideals that we impose on our neighbors, we want them to be good to us. We want them to be kind. We want them to be consistent. We want them to uh, not lie to us, not steal from us. We don't want them to be greedy. Like all of these are holy <laughs> things that we are expecting of our neighbors. And so imagine if we lived in a society where there was no moral standard uh, as given to us in the law of God, then, then earth would have nothing 
like nothing anchoring it saying, no, there is, there is better. And there is, there is more. And there is a, there is a way of living that dignifies humanity and doesn't destroy it. And so that's the irony is that we really do want holiness. We just don't want it at the expense of ourselves. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's interesting. We want other people to live holy. We don't want to live holy. Hello. <laughs> I want you to be nice to me, but I don't want to be nice to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You've also, uh, I think it would be crazy to have you on a G3 project and not talk about your uh, Jude uh, Bible study. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Tell that's our true. audience a little bit about wh why Jude was such an impactful book for you that you decided to, to write on it. Oh. <sighs> It's like the little brother that nobody pays attention to, you know, and I felt like I had to say, no, like all scripture is God breathed and profitable for teaching and for training in righteousness um, and for building us up for the work of ministry. And so I felt like, man, like, let me let me bring this back to our attention. Um, but I think the, the, the compelling thing about Jew that people miss is that he legit is dealing with a lot of the stuff that we deal with in the church today and in our culture. Um, and he's answering many of our questions, the questions that we ask at, you know, uh, Q and A's during uh, conferences. You know, he says like, hey, like it's, it's cats out here teaching you that God's grace is a license to sin. Um, and if you try to apply that today, people may not be esteeming and exalting God's grace, but we are exalting his love saying, hey, here's an attribute of God. Let's boost this up and use it as a way to recommend perversion. And it's just like, yeah, no, we need to contend against that. Um, and then he spends the whole body of his letter talking about the fact that God will judge people that teach falsely, that God will judge people that uh, lead people astray and lead people away from godliness, which is another necessary message that we serve a God that is just. We serve a God who is justice, is righteous. But then he closes it by encouraging us like, yeah, they tripping and, and they going off the rails. But to him who was able to keep you from falling. Hello. And so I think Jude yeah. is one book that like every Christian really needs to um, yeah, spend more time in. Yes. So make sure y'all get that uh, Jude uh, Bible study in addition to. Come on, promote Lisa. Holier than thou. Come on here. <laughs> what the what what are some challenges about God's holiness as you were writing this book that made you reflect and say man that's that is challenging to me personally Whew. um a lot of it but i i think one aspect in particular is his justice uh how in exodus Three, no, can't be somewhere in Exodus when God, uh, Exodus 34, when God speaks with Moses when he's in the cleft of the rock and he says, The Lord, the Lord, uh, slow to anger, compassionate, uh, you know, having steadfast love, who will by no means clear the guilty. And you realize that God's righteous standard is, is so high that he must judge sinners. But then you think about yourself and you say, but I'm still alive. Like us are just reached out and, and touched the ark and he, and he dropped dead. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Ananias and Sapphira just said a little lie and they dropped dead. I didn't did more than that all the time. <laughs> so for me, that was, that was the thing that got to me is that God has been more forbearing and patient towards us than we are willing to give him credit for. Uh, and that just, that convicts me on another level because it's like, I don't even exhibit that kind of patience. You know what I'm saying? Like mm -hmm. somebody sins against me once and I want to cut them off. I want to, I want to be vengeful. But it's like, even God himself is slow to anger. And so both of those <laughs> thing is just like, wow, like yo, you, you different. Yeah, that's that's so helpful and, and such a helpful thought. And and we as you were talking, I started to think about how I was just talking. Esau was on the podcast a couple weeks ago. We were talking about how people think there's two different gods: the Old Testament God mm -hmm. and the New Testament God. The Old Testament God is angry, and then the New Testament yeah. God is nice. 
um, and yeah. loving. And if you read scripture as it's written from Genesis to Revelation, you you know, as you're articulating, God has always been merciful. God's always mm-hmm. been so to anger. He didn't mm-hmm. just wipe them out. Now, there's instances, as you said, in the Old Testament and in the New, where it's like you get one and done. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. that one and done also is what the part of your life that we saw. But we don't know mm-hmm. Ananias and Sapphira's history. So we only see them one time. And that's when that's they true. get that one and done. But they could have been living filthy their whole life. And God was merciful to them. Um, My goodness. That's an observation but, right there. But we just we just see them at one aspect of their life where God cut them off. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I love how you highlighted that because I think that's helpful for us to look at it. And that goes along with something I know you're passionate about, just reading the whole word. Um, yeah. Don't just um, cherry pick, take the whole role, yeah. as Ezekiel said, the bitter with the sweet. Mm-hmm. Because, I mean, I, I, we know this, but like you really can't. You cannot understand much of the New Testament without knowing the old. You just can't. It, it's not written in such a way where you can isolate these books from one another. You know, how, how are you going to understand the book of Hebrews? How are you going to understand Romans? How are you going to understand Jude even? Like they are constantly making reference to the Old Testament. And so I think seeing how both of these hold hands just gives you a really clearer picture of God himself um, and what he intends for us to believe about him. That's awesome. When you said whole hands, I just thought like a, a illustrator illustrating the old and new Testament holding hands. That'd be dope. That would be pretty. Um, somebody should do that. Um, they should. Cause if I any illustrators are like watching, that. send us that tag us. Um, I don't want to do the work, <laughs> like, but if you feel moved, like this, <laughs> And they're going to put a world beneath it. Like <laughs> They always got <laughs> worlds and hands next to each other in pictures. I don't get it. So, so what, are, what are the apologetic challenges you see? I know people give uh, you, send you a lot of questions. You and Preston. Preston has um, conversations on the street. Is that what it's? Street combos, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, he talks not, to strangers about the faith. Yeah. Jackie, not so much. I don't see her talking mm-hmm. to strangers on the street. No, ma'am. <laughs> but uh y'all are an apologetic uh family um you sure. you um are engaging y'all have different personality types so i think Preston's more extroverted you're more introverted mm-hmm. so he'll be on the street but you also do it online through your books also mm-hmm. and and through other ways so y'all are apologetic at y'all core as a unit, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. which is great to see. What are the challenges y'all are seeing um, in 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 y'all work? Man, um, I know Preston. He would say in his in his field in particular, he he would say that the evangelical response to justice and social justice issues is such a stumbling block to a lot of the conversations that he has uh, in the barbershop on the street. Um, and so I, I think that's definitely a, an apologetic hindrance that uh, there's a, just a large swath of the church uh, that does not, they confess to be Christians, but they don't actually seem to function uh, like Christians. I think for me, especially because the 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 lane I tend to fall in in many times is sexuality, but also just woman. I'm at woman conferences all the time. I, I think there is um, a biblical illiteracy problem. I think there is a just a self-centeredness to how we understand the Christian faith and even how we read the Bible. And I think what that does is it not only hinders our ability to interpret with interpret the scriptures without ourselves at the center. But I think it also hinders us from living in a Bible community where even those kinds of hindrances can be challenged and then overcome, if that makes sense. And Mm -hmm. so I think just having also a faulty view of the church (laughs) and our need for it and that social media and podcasts and conferences and all of that is good, but it's it's not sufficient to sustain us, especially as we venture into a world that is getting more wicked by the day. And that wickedness is convincing. It, it, it's compelling. It sounds logical. It sounds just. 
to live for yourself, but it's not. And so there's many, but I think those two are really important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that, um, that biblical literacy that you mentioned and the self-centeredness oftentimes of preaching, uh, Mm -hmm. work, work hand in hand. Um, because I always tell pastors, people are going to study how you preach. Come so on. Yes. Principles, they're going to study principles. So they're going to go to the concordance and find all the faith passages and study mm. them out of context. Uh, mm. uh, you know, they're going to study. So if you teach them through your preaching, how to study the word by preaching, exp- uh, expository t- uh, preaching, which I mean, that's mm-hmm. not, you know, you could do topical, but have a healthy balance. But if you don't teach people how to go through the word, they're always going to think about scripture going for a point or principle, not necessarily going Uh through scripture to understand it. That's absolutely true. Cause so much of how I study the Bible is based on how I observed other people study the Bible (laughs) period. Mm -hmm. And so, but I, I still think the bad thing is I imagine that there are people in solid sound preaching churches, but the pastor is competing with social media pastors, you know? Mm -hmm. And so like, it's like, because the social media pastor got on Yeezys and and I'm not saying Yeezys, I got Yeezys, you get what I'm saying? But I'm saying all of these superficial external things uh, do something to our eyes where we start to get distracted. And now we looking at our preacher like, oh, he not, you know, he not talking to the issues of my day. He's hard to apply because he way up here. And it's like, nah, like, like, let your pastor pastor you. Yeah, girl. Because th- those, uh, the popular pastors ain't going to marry you, bury you. Hello. Come to your, come when there's a crisis. Um, <laughs> if somebody in your family died, they're not going to be able to comfort you. They might give you a nice line, but they're not going to mm. be there. When crisis and you can't observe their fruit. Their captions mm-hmm. is not fruit. It's a mm-hmm. caption. Mm-hmm. That that's that's just a gift of communication. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like I, I need to see gifts of the spirit, and you have the privilege <laughs> of being able to observe that in your actual pastors that you have access to. Definitely. Well, I want to circle back to the reason we're here. Holier than thou. I'm gonna hold it up again. Nice cover, by the way. I like how it looks um, worn and it's new at the same time. So mm-hmm. don't cause that. Because we praise the ancient of days, Miss. Amen. All right. My God. That almost sent me the tongue. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and the stained glass. That's dope, too. Just kudos yeah. to you on design. Shout out to creators who think about aesthetic. That it matters. matters. It really does. I um, didn't bought books just because the cover looked nice. <laughs> Yes, it's like, it really. I don't even will. know if the words are good, but I like that cover. Yeah, it will bring you in. Uh, mm-hmm. What other things about the book Holier Than Thou that you want our audience to know that we haven't already talked about? Yeah. Um, again, that God uh, being holy is a, is a good thing. And, and the subtitle of the book is How God's Holiness Helps Us Trust Him. And I, I wrote that because, again, Uh, The doctrine of holiness can, you know, stay in our minds, stay up there in the cloud somewhere. But I think when we understand that God's holiness is actually an incentive for our faith, then we recognize why it's something that we need to understand and thus believe. And I got that framework from two passages in scripture. One is Jeremiah 2, where God is speaking to Israel and he says, what injustice uh, or what worthlessness have you found in me? that you left me and went off the worthlessness and became worthless. And then in John eight, Jesus is talking to Israel again. He says, can any of you convict me of sin? If not, why don't you believe me? And in both instances, you have God presenting his moral purity as the reason why he's worthy to be trusted, worthy mm-hmm. to be loved, worthy to be near. Um, and so I think that's a really interesting perspective so that when you get get into the book and when you get into the resources that the book explains, whether it's Exodus or or uh, John or whatever, you start to see, man, God is saying that there is nothing in me that is bad. <laughs> there is nothing in me that is limited. I, everything I am is sovereign and sufficient, uh, good and righteous, 
wise and perfect. And so why not trust my word? Why not surrender your body? Why not give me your mind? Um, especially when you compare him to idols. Idols are always held up as profitless, as useless. Why? Because they're insufficient to be God. Therefore, they cannot be holy. And so I think um, that's what I want people to see is that, man, if God is holy, that means you cannot treat him as if he has the potential to be be sinful towards you or, or be anything less than good. That doesn't mean it won't hurt because like the spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness and God laid on him the sin of everybody and judged him in the flesh. And so to be in Christ does not mean that I won't suffer, but it does mean that again, God is so sovereign and so good that he will utilize it for our good and for his glory. So that's what I want people to see is that this ain't just so you can learn a bunch of stuff. It's literally so that your faith will be stronger. That's Amen. that's my soapbox and I'm off of it. Amen. Woman of God. Jesus. <laughs> you tell me to talk about this a lot. I got excited. <laughs> no, I think that that is helpful. As as we we mentioned biblical literacy and one of the things that you know, I know that you're passionate about is people reading scripture. Um, for those who are struggling to read scripture, to to love the word of God, what what uh, tools would you to offer them or what strategies to falling in love with God's word? Hmm. There's so many because I could I could I could offer tools, but then if I don't address the idols that might be keeping you from loving the scriptures, mm -hmm. then it's like I'm just giving you, you get what I'm saying? Like it, it's sometimes we don't love the scriptures because we don't love God himself sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think even just being honest with ourselves, honest with our heart about what it is that's keeping me from loving this book that reveals God. So get that out the way. I think from there, one thing that I see uh, in this generation in particular is that we really lack patience when it comes to reading and studying the word of God. And I think that comes from, you know, these 10 minute devotionals, uh, these quick little clips on Instagram. Like we just want a quick word all the time. Mm -hmm. And so when we get in the scriptures, because we didn't get it quickly or we didn't get a word that engaged our affections quick enough and all of that, we just close it and we move on. But it's like, man, the people that you look to, these, these pastors that you follow that give you this good word, that 30 minute sermon might've came through four weeks of prep and four weeks of study and meditation and talking through it and begging God and wrestling with the text. And so I think that's one thing is we need is we need patience while studying the scriptures, which is to say, hey, you may not get everything the first time, but that's okay. <laughs> like stay, stay, stay there, have the Holy Spirit be with you in it. Like Holy Spirit, help me, help me understand this thing. I don't get it. And now help me apply. And I promise you, if you stay faithful to that, if you lean into that, God will show you things in the text that you did not know was there. Why? Because the spirit himself is what illuminates the word since the spirit himself is who inspired it. And so, yeah, get rid of your idols and endure through that thing. And then listen to two, three podcasts and go to Courageous Conversations uh, the first weekend of September. Yes. Shout out to that Courageous Conversations. I want to go so was, bad. I was supposed to promote that at the beginning. Um, but <laughs> so shout out You're to you. <laughs> <laughs> We are actually sold out of in-person tickets. So those who want to come in person, uh, yeah, we're out. But you can come virtually uh, mm -hmm. for uh, get a virtual pass. We won't be live streaming, but you can get a virtual pass at CourageousConvos.org. So make sure you do that. Shout out to Jackie for reminding me of that because I completely forgot. God I'm bless right you. Down, so I could watch it that weekend. Okay. Yeah. I, I didn't know if you wanted to travel uh, five months uh, <laughs> pregnant. That might be a lot. I am. I am. I, I got something to do that weekend. That's the problem. But I would. Well, you I could. Would, I'll, it'll, the replay will last for 48 hours. Okay. So you could go. I'm going to watch it. I'm going to be like this with my coffee. <laughs> 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 like, look at them. They're going in. So. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for joining us, Jackie. How can people get your book? Um, yeah. Holier Than That. It's. 
I'm and sorry, how ahead. can they reach you on social? Um, holier than thou book.net is probably the best because you can, you know, uh, click on all the sources uh, that has it. And then social media. I don't think there's other Jackie Hill pairs. There might be. And so I think if you just type in Jackie Hill pair uh, and you see a brown skinned girl with a gap, long dress and a bunch of kids, then that's me. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Jackie. It's been a pleasure having you on the podcast. Remember to get her book. I'll hold it up again, Holier Than Thou. Thank you all for watching another episode of the Jew 3 Project podcast. Uh, you can catch all our past episodes at Jew3Project.org. Remember, you can get our curriculum, merch, or take online classes all at Jew3Project.org. Or you can become a monthly partner uh, by going to Jew3Project.org backslash donate. Remember here at the Jew 3 Project, we're helping you to know what you believe and why you believe it. Until next time, grace and peace and God bless you.